So we're going to do, do a joint presentation based on a pilot study, nothing like as much data as, <laughs> as the faculty who presented before us. But I think this is interesting in a sense because it's a, in, sorry, uh, a new kind of methodology, which I'm not sure how much they, are you all public health students? Okay, so we're using feminist, me oh, sorry, <gasps> did not have sound effects. We're using feminist methods in our data collection, which is really very useful when you're studying food practices. So both of us, Rosa, Dr. Soto, and I are dual identity women. I'm a first generation Indian immigrant, and Rosa's uh, a second, are you first generation? First generation. Okay, so Rosa, Rosa is also a first generation Latina immigrant. And what we were interested in looking at is the, the structure, the changes in the deep structures that immigration produces. And these, you know, deep structures of life, which is of interest in communication for sure, but this especially affects food practices. So our question, broad question of interest is, what parts of reality are lost for immigrants? Um, what part of cultural food, traditional food practices change as part of an Americanized identity? Um, and of course, we're talking two diff completely different cultures here, but we're going to focus on Hispanics and Latinas for this study, for this pilot, um, for a couple of reasons. As you know, you heard from um, Dr. Viladrich's presentation this morning, it's the fastest growing population. And so food practices are really of, of importance from a health perspective. Um, there was a huge NYU study, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, a very large one of the Latino population in the New York boroughs. And then Rosa went to this conference focusing on Latino food practices. Um, I know I'm talking fast because her stuff's more interesting. <laughs> so we're going to use, we did use feminist methods, and as we extend the study, I'm um, going to be interviewing Indian women this summer, and Rosa's going to return to a larger Latina population. We used autoethnography, which many of you, anybody familiar with that? So autoethnography is not a social science method, and it's not very accepted in social science. But it's very accepted in gender studies and it, as a feminist methodology. And what it is, is allows the researcher to, to go from a knowledge of self to extend their knowledge outside. So, you know, which we all begin a research with our own interests anyway. So you're reflecting inwards and then moving your, that knowledge outwards, but we're supplementing that autoethnography because then, it, you know, although it's a perfectly valid feminist method, we're also doing some social science methodology by using semi-structured interviews. And in the interviews, we asked two broad, really broad questions allowing for interactivity. Um, we, we asked the person we're interviewing, and it's, it's recorded, to describe their typical food preparation in their home country. Just a typical day, you know, for all the way from getting the food, preparing it to eating it, and then describe those same things in the United States. And now, okay. and now for the good part. No, no. I, I disagree about the good part. I think all of everything that everyone has been saying all day is, is good. I was thinking about things that had been said, um, mentioned by all of these great doctors, um, including the fact that when we drive uh, my nephew from his school to the house, it's about 60 blocks in Miami, and in the 60 blocks in Miami that we drive to, there must be like four churches, fr chicken places. I don't know if you know what churches is, but it's like a fast food chicken joint in Miami. And I can't tell you how many McDonald's, Burger King's, um, <laughs> Snappers, which is a fried fish place. The Whole Foods, by extension, is about 20 minutes away in a completely different community, not, wi not within what we call walkable distance in our neighborhood. Um, so I, I would say that this is really reflective of that class um, issue that we're talking about because in lower income communities, and the one I'm talking about is actually called unincorporated Dade County, which if anyone knows means basically no one is in charge of this like 60 block area basically that is just sort of, I, I don't know if abandoned is the right word, but I'm going to go with it, abandoned by um, uh, local um, government. And so um, the Whole Foods, like I said, is in a nicer area. And and you need a car to get there, so there'd be no way. And then once you get to those, if you've been to the super supermarket on Halden Road, the first thing that you do is you walk in, and on the right-hand side is like the 
vegetables. This is what we call our food desert because it's literally like two or three tiny aisles, right? And the food is like, I'm not kidding. I went there the other days to get some broccoli because I was going to make some pasta broccoli thing. And the broccoli was like ages old. I mean, it was like defunct. And so that's what they call really a food desert, a place where even if you're going to go and get fruits and vegetables, you're, they're seriously lacking in terms of what they're giving you and how old the product is. By extension, if you go to Whole Foods, which you, by the way, again, have to drive to, right? You have to drive to Whole Foods. The food there is like, you know, eight rows of, you know, grapes and, you know, a, 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 just a wide plethora of food options. And in those places where the, there's a wide option of food um, options, it's really expensive, right? Like I bought, I bought a bag of grapes and the grapes were $9. Now I can afford $9 maybe, um, bag of grapes, but you have to ask yourself how many people in low income communities can afford that. I mean, it was like a small bag of grapes and it was $9. So how could you feed a whole family uh, for a whole week on that? So you have to be thinking about those kinds of things. That's not to say that Whole Foods doesn't have its discount products and such, but I would imagine that going to what you're saying, it's the discounted objects that super, super megado, you can get a bag of rice. You know what I mean? It's like discounted. The white rice, not the brown rice the white rice and it's like a big huge bag that you can feed your family for weeks off of and it's like ten dollars for this huge bag right by extension if you go to whole foods to buy a bag of brown rice which is like this tiny it's like six dollars this tiny so how could you feed your entire family so there are these kinds of things that are going into this so uh, i am in, in the English department. So we um, in the English department are really interested in stories. Um, and so that's how this begins is that I was at my mom's house one weekend when her cousin Tila came over and Tila cooked I mean, people, she cooked this meal that was beyond comprehension. I don't know how you go because I never I'm also not used to PowerPoint <laughs> in the English field. You talk. Okay, no. Okay, so she cooked this meal that was just beyond you know, anyone who's inter knows the Caribbean or um, is uh, knowledgeable about Puerto Ricans, she cooked acapuria, which is green bananas and plantains stuffed with ground beans and then deeply fried bacalito, which is salt cod fritters filled with minced codfish and deeply fried sorullos, a cornmeal based dish that is stuffed with cheese and yes, deeply fried, bacalao con cebollas, the codfish with onions, the only dish not fried, and deeply fried plantain chips. The only vegetable in the entire meal was this, uh, what we call chayote, which is included is the green bananas with patata, a white sweet potato, which is a highly high starch dish. Um, and, and to say that I get a, a rarely get this meal in Jersey is an understatement. All my friends are vegans, vegetarians, and whole food eaters. So <laughs> it's a very rare Rare thing. So she cooked this. She knew I was coming into town, so she cooked this really elaborate meal. I noticed this was hours. I mean, like I'm I'm saying like at minimum five hours that my mom and, and Tila were in the kitchen cooking this food. I noticed the entire time as we're snacking, we are snacking. I noticed that Tila didn't touch a bit of it. I mean, I it was amazing, you know. She cooked this huge meal, and my mom and she, while they were cooking, this is important, and this is part of the autoethnography that Pixie and I are talking about, um, because what was important in that five hours was that my mom and Tila really connected with each other. They didn't get to see each other very often because they both had really big families and on top of having really big families, they worked. So they had, they worked, they had really big families. They simply didn't have time to get together except Tila comes over like two or three times a year when she knows that I'm coming into town to cook this meal. And they spent hours talking, bonding, sharing. It was amazing, really. I thought it was just so empowered. And, and I was like analyzing them, right, from like the living room. But in fact, they were just so, so, so very much enjoying each other's company. And I felt a little actually at loss in some sense, because I felt like because I was that, you know, uh, other generation, right? These people, these women were born in Puerto Rico. They had grown up together. I felt a little bit like I was too American to join in, if that makes a little bit of sense. I felt a little bit at loss with the cooking even because the cooking was being created by women who had been cooking 
like this for for decades, right? And I'm just sort of starting to learn, and I can't even learn the way I want to learn because at, if you were here for the earlier 11 a.m. session, the problem with cooking the way it is is I can't eat that anymore. I'm really big, and, and I mentioned this to Thila. I said, I'm so big. Like, why are you cooking this elaborate meal for me? But she really didn't have any other way to show her love for me, if that makes sense. She had no other way of understanding. I, I For her, she thought I was a foreign body if that makes sense, because I was in a different kind of world, right? I, I didn't even live in Miami anymore. I, I, you know, I'm all about reading books. I'm a nerd, right? And so she really had no other way to sort of say, I, I, I love you and your mom, except to cook this elaborate meal with me. And if I came into the picture and said, okay, can you like not fry anything? That would really be, she would be like, I don't know who you are and I can't talk to you anymore. And she would, right? So this was part of this kind of, uh, of of thing that we were just sort of signing. I'm trying to figure out in this project, Pixie and I are trying to figure out what there is in terms of loss, especially for those second, first or second generation, but the second generation and third generation people who come sort of to the United States and because those foods aren't appropriate anymore have to change their complete diets and in changing their complete diets really sort of change the family dynamic and family structure. So they're really losing something. And that 11 o'clock uh, session where she was talking about nostalgia, it is nostalgia. I feel most deeply connected to my family when I'm at home and cooking with them. If I'm not at home and cooking with them, I feel very distanced. Not just geographically, I'm talking about just like familial and, and distance from my own Latina heritage. Do you want to? Sorry, yeah. we're doing the PowerPoints together. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, as Rosa's story illustrates, we found that for immigrant women, food, just like you know, our morning speaker said, food really nurtures family mm -hmm. and strengthens community. So it's an expression. Um, and it's, it's even in my, as an Indian woman, food is like the basis of all celebrations. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, when, it, when it's, there's a conflict, the paradox between assimilation, yes. right? Because immigrants feel a, a stronger pressure to assimilate. Although there is a, a, a greater acceptance now of diversity, um, with, especially with Latina or Caribbean immigrants, there's this, a greater paradox. When you have a pull between unhealthy foods that, right. that reflect the culture and the healthy food that are idealized. And we say idealized because a lot of American foods are not at all healthy, but the image that the media presents, right? So we're in a pilot. We'll be continuing this. May, if you're interested, come talk to us. We'd love to yes. interview you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.